Welcome to this educational video about kidney transplantation. I'm John Pallison, a transplant surgeon at Indiana University Hospital. Kidney transplantation is a modern miracle and we are fortunate to have it, but it's complicated. My hope is to help you understand it. The kidneys are two bean-shaped organs on each side of the spine. They're only about the size of a fist, but despite their small size, the kidneys receive an enormous amount of blood flow, about one quarter of the heart's total output. This makes sense because the main function of the kidneys is to clean the body's blood. Without kidney function, the body gets choked with poisons. One way to survive with kidney failure is to artificially replace kidney function. But the kidney is a complex organ with many functions. So let's look at kidney functions and how they can be replaced or managed artificially. The main function of the kidneys is to clean and filter the blood. The artificial replacement of that function is dialysis. The most common dialysis is hemodialysis. Hemo means blood. So hemodialysis refers to the purification of blood as a substitute for kidney function. To clean the blood, you need to pump it through a machine, which you can see here. To bring the blood into the machine, you need a connection between the body and the machine. This is called dialysis access and is created surgically. Dialysis access is associated with complications like clotting and infections and the need for frequent surgeries. You can also do dialysis with fluid in your belly, which acts as a filter. That's peritoneal dialysis. But either way has potential complications from surgical access and infections. Whereas a normal kidney works continuously, dialysis is intermittent. In between dialysis, poisons build up, and then dialysis removes these poisons. So the dialysis patient swings from one extreme to the other. This is associated with low energy and makes it difficult to have a full life. Kidneys also regulate body fluid. So dialysis patients typically need to restrict fluid intake to keep in balance between dialysis. The kidneys also regulate body acids, sodium and potassium. Potassium is particularly significant because a high potassium can lead to abnormal heart rhythms. Unfortunately, many foods are high in potassium, including many of the healthiest foods like fruits and vegetables. So the dialysis patient has to restrict intake of these foods. Because of this, it's difficult to have a healthy and appealing diet on dialysis. Kidneys regulate bone metabolism through calcium, vitamin D, and phosphorus levels. When the kidneys do not function properly, calcium is leached from bones, causing osteoporosis. And this calcium builds up in the blood vessels, causing hardening of the blood vessels. You can actually see the hardening of the arteries in this x-ray, showing a blood vessel lined with calcium. A healthy blood vessel would not be visible on a plain film like this. Sometimes people who have been on dialysis for years have blood vessels like rocks, making it impossible to sew in a transplant kidney. The kidneys also make a hormone, erythropoietin, that stimulates bone marrow to make red cells and thus prevent anemia. For this reason, dialysis patients are frequently anemic and may need blood transfusions. All of these processes are the reasons kidneys are essential for life. It's possible to replace these functions to some extent while on dialysis, but a real kidney does a much better job at balancing these finely regulated processes. Okay, then how do we put in a real kidney? A kidney has three connections, an artery, a vein, and a ureter. The blood with poisons goes into the kidney through the artery. The kidney cleans the blood. The clean blood is returned to the rest of the body through the vein, and the poisons are eliminated out the ureter, which carries urine to the bladder. So to transplant a kidney, you need to make three connections in the recipient. An incision is made in the lower belly. Under this incision are blood vessels which supply the leg. These vessels are called the iliac artery and the iliac vein. The kidney is placed next to these blood vessels, the kidney's artery is connected to the iliac artery, and the kidney's vein is connected to the iliac vein. That leaves the third connection, the ureter, which is connected to the bladder. 
So a kidney transplant is basically three pipes that have to be connected to the appropriate streams. One question I hear frequently, do my own kidneys get removed? The kidneys you're born with are called the native kidneys. Although they aren't functioning, the native kidneys are not actually hurting anything either. So they aren't usually removed. Another question, why is the transplant kidney placed in a different location from the native kidneys? Because in the groin, the blood vessels and bladder to which the kidney is sewn are easier to get to, much easier than where the native kidneys are. In some conditions, though, the kidneys are bothersome and are removed. For example, in polycystic kidney disease, the kidneys become very big, and one kidney can be removed at the time of transplant. This doesn't change where the kidney transplant goes. The potential complications of transplantation include failure of blood vessel connections or of the ureter connection, but these are rare complications. Of more concern, kidney transplantation, being major surgery, is a stress to the heart. If the patient's heart has blockages of the heart's arteries, then the extra demand that surgery places on the heart can lead to a heart attack kind of like shoveling snow with a bum heart. For this reason, almost all transplant candidates undergo a heart stress test. If the stress test is positive, then the heart won't tolerate the stress of surgery. In that case, the patient is referred for treatment of the heart disease before transplantation. With this screen, it is rare that transplant patients have a heart attack at the time of surgery. Of course, it's important to control risk factors for heart disease. Smoking is particularly unhealthy. Smoking poisons just about every organ. Especially relevant here, smoking damages the heart and lungs and therefore makes the anesthesia required for kidney transplantation more risky. It also hardens blood vessels, so it might not be possible to sew in a kidney to these hard vessels. This is on top of the hardening of arteries that tends to occur with kidney failure anyway. In other words, if you smoke, you need to quit. Being overweight is another heart risk factor. Since a kidney is placed in the belly, having a big belly makes surgery more difficult, so you might have to lose weight to be a transplant candidate. If you think about some obvious high-calorie foods like sodas and fast food and quit those, you can make a big difference in your weight. And of course, physical activity helps. It's especially important for dialysis patients to control heart risk factors because the imbalances of dialysis damage the heart over time. As a reflection of this damage, there is a 75% chance of a heart attack after three years of dialysis. Now, up to now we've discussed the surgical aspects of transplantation. We also need to consider that the transplant kidney is a foreign organ. Anything foreign in the body is interpreted to be a foreign organism, in other words, an infection. This activates the immune system whose job it is to fight off infections. Here is an infection in the bloodstream. The germ is green. The red blood cells carry oxygen to the tissues. The white cells fight infections. So when a white cell encounters a germ, it attacks it. So let's go back to the kidney transplant. As I mentioned, the kidney is a foreign organ. To a white cell, this foreign organ looks like an infection. So when white cells encounter the transplant kidney, they attack it. If we let this happen, the kidney is rejected from the body by the white cells. This is what is meant by rejection. To prevent that, we give drugs to the white cells that put blinders on the white cells. Thanks to these drugs, the white cells cannot see the foreign organ, which is then accepted and therefore can function normally. The white cells are immune cells. The white cells with the blinders on are suppressed. So the drugs we give to suppress the white cells are called immunosuppressive medications. Immunosuppressive medications prevent rejection. So what happens if you don't take the immunosuppression? You guessed it. If you don't take your immunosuppressive medications, the blinders come off the white cells and rejection of the kidney can occur. This can occur at any time after the transplant. 
So what are the effects of immunosuppression? In general, the immune system fights infections and some cancers. So with immunosuppression, the immune system doesn't fight as well. Modern immunosuppression is very good at sparing most of the immune system, so most of the immune system can still do its job. Only the part of the immune system that causes rejection has to be suppressed. That part of the immune system also fights certain viruses and cancers, so after transplantation, there is an increased chance of these, particularly a virus called cytomegalovirus, or CMV. To lower the chances of that, we give an antiviral medication called valcite during the first months after transplantation. So when all is said and done, which is better, dialysis or a transplanted kidney? Dialysis doesn't filter perfectly, so poisons accumulate in damaged organs such as the heart. Patients have low energy and require diet and fluid limitations. And then there's the surgical access and those complications. On the other hand, transplantation gives the patient a real kidney with complete and balanced function, but requires major surgery and drugs that prevent rejection but suppress part of the immune system. So which is better? Generally, to compare two therapies, we look at survival. In other words, which of these options allows you to live the longest? Here is depicted the survival of US dialysis patients, percent survival, and number of years. You can see that after 10 years, the survival on dialysis goes down markedly. Only 10% of dialysis patients are alive at 10 years. On the other hand, the survival after a living donor or deceased donor transplant is much better. In other words, a real kidney is so much better than a machine that even with the complications of immunosuppression and the need for major surgery, transplantation leads to much better health than dialysis. What about quality of life? The most common observation I hear from transplant recipients is how much more energy they have. It's like a curtain was raised and they didn't even realize how tired they were. Also, if you have to be frequently tethered to a machine, it's hard to keep a job. It's easier to work with a transplant. Similarly, it's easier to travel and you don't have any dietary restrictions, so eating is easier and better. All in all then, quality of life is generally much better after a transplant than with dialysis. So in comparison to dialysis, a kidney transplant allows you to live longer and better and is therefore almost always the preferred choice. Here's the problem with transplantation. A lot of people want it, so the wait list for a kidney transplant grows every year. There are now over 50,000 patients on the kidney wait list. Unfortunately, the number of people on the wait list far outstrips the number of deceased donor transplants, which are the blue bars in this graph. As a result, it's not unusual to see patients wait five years or more on dialysis before receiving a kidney. But during those years on dialysis, the body accumulates damage, like blood vessel hardening. So the sooner the transplant, the better. This is why we do living donor transplantation. Living donor transplantation can avoid dialysis completely. Also, living donors are very healthy individuals. You can't be a donor if you have health issues that might damage a kidney. So these are top-notch, extremely healthy kidneys. The recipients of a living donor kidney have the best survival because they receive a top-notch kidney and don't need to be on dialysis very long. Better than the survival of a deceased donor kidney recipient. And of course, as mentioned, both types of transplant patients have a much better survival than those who stay on dialysis. One thing that makes living donation easier is that it's now done through minimally invasive techniques so the pain is less and recovery is faster than with traditional open surgery. So who can be a donor? The donor has to be a healthy adult, basically. Doesn't have to be a relative. Doesn't even have to be compatible. Well, how can that be? To understand this, let's take Mr. and Ms. Blue. Ms. Blue needs a kidney and Mr. Blue is healthy enough to donate, but is not compatible. Mr. and Ms. Red are another couple in a similar situation. Mr. Red has kidney failure. 
Ms. Red is healthy enough to donate, but is also not compatible. It just so happens, however, that Mr. Blue is compatible with Mr. Red, and Ms. Red is compatible with Ms. Blue. So Ms. Red can donate a kidney to Ms. Blue, and Mr. Blue can donate a kidney to Mr. Red. A win-win. With the miracle of computers in a big country like the US, this swapping can be carried out over many pairs to maximize everyone's chance of getting a suitable kidney. This is called the paired donor exchange. And so for the last several years, IU routinely participates in chains involving multiple centers all over the country. In fact, as I record this, we are working on a 13 pair chain, for instance. So a living donor is the best option for a transplant recipient, but let's say you don't have a living donor then the next best possibility is a deceased donor transplant. How does that work? To get a deceased donor kidney, you have to go on the wait list. As I mentioned, there are over 50,000 people on the kidney wait list in the US, and the list is growing. So how does the list work? First off, by and large, there is one list for each blood group, and a patient rises to the top of that list based on time. This time starts from the date dialysis started. So let's say you started dialysis three years ago, but you've been cleared for transplantation only one week ago. You will actually have three years of waiting time on the list, not just one week. Deceased donors have more complex issues than living donors who generally have a straightforward medical history. Let's compare the two. Here's a living donor, typically a healthy, active individual. Here's a deceased donor. The patient is dead in the ICU on mechanical support, pretty much the opposite of healthy. Also, whereas only healthy individuals can be living donors, deceased donors can have conditions that might damage a kidney. For example, a deceased donor could have diabetes, whereas a person with diabetes would not be considered for living donation. So a deceased donor kidney is often not as healthy as a living donor kidney. And in the act of dying, kidney damage can occur. For example, the patient may have lost a lot of blood in a car accident with low blood pressure as a result. This could damage the kidneys. Finally, another difference is that living donors provide their own history, so the medical history is very liable. In contrast, for deceased donors, family members may or may not be privy to it. For example, how well do you know the details of your uncle's medical history? So the medical history is a lot less reliable in a deceased donor. Given these difficulties, how can we tell if the deceased donor kidney is good? All deceased donors are ranked on a scale that includes factors that affect how good the kidney is, such as blood tests that tell us about kidney health, whether the donor had health issues, and how the donor died. These factors are then plugged into a formula which ranks the kidneys. There are basically three categories of kidneys. Most kidneys will be standard average kidneys, the sedans. A small number will be spectacular, the Ferraris. And at the other end, a small number will have a lot of miles on them. So who gets the Ferraris? To determine this, patients are also ranked according to life expectancy. Factors such as age, dialysis status, and diabetes are plugged into a formula. Most people will be ranked together, but the top 20% are considered healthier than average, and these are usually younger patients who are healthy except for kidney disease. This top 20% group in terms of longevity is, by definition, going to live the longest. So they need a kidney with the most years. It makes sense, then, to give them the kidneys that are going to last the most years, namely the Ferraris of the kidney ranking. So if a top-notch deceased donor kidney becomes available, it is first offered to patients ranked the highest in terms of expected survival. Does that mean the other 80% can never get a Ferrari? Here's where there are potential opportunities for the other 80%. Not all Ferrari kidneys are wanted. Why would that be? It's possible that the owner of the Ferrari kidney may have been up to questionable behavior. Let's see what this means. Transplanted organs can carry an infection. 
similar to infections that can be transmitted in a blood transfusion. So you might ask, don't we just test the donor's blood? We do, but here's the problem with this testing. There's a gap between the time the individual is exposed to an infection and the time the test turns positive. So because people can do things that could result in a transmissible infection, you want a blood test that could detect this, but there is a time gap between when the infection occurs and when the test turns positive. Until a few years ago, it took three months for a test to turn positive. In other words, there was a three-month gap during which the test wasn't reliable. A three-month gap was long enough that we couldn't rely only on blood tests to screen donors. So for a blood donor, the question is, is it likely that this donor could have gotten infected in the last three months? In order to protect our blood supply, the Center for Disease Control, or CDC, put together a list of what it considers risky behavior in terms of disease transmission in blood. For example, someone shooting up drugs would be at risk to get infected in the last three months, so would be excluded as a blood donor. Let's go back to the deceased donor. Just like we don't know the medical history very well, we don't always know what the individual was up to before death. Was there any risky behavior? So the list that the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, put together for blood donors is also used for organ donors. Those who have those behaviors are listed CDC high risk. As I mentioned, the gap used to be three months, so we had to rely a lot on the behavioral screens of donors. But a very important development has recently occurred. New testing is much better, so the gap now is only 10 days. So the test will only miss an infection if it occurred in the 10 days before death. This is very different from when the gap was three months. With this new and better testing in mind, let's go back to the deceased donor. Let's say we know the donor did IV drugs. He will then be labeled CDC high risk. Like all donors, he will undergo extensive screening blood tests, and there are two possibilities. First, the blood test could be positive for an infection. In that case, the patient is ruled out as a donor. Second possibility, the test is negative. In that case, we have to ask, what is the risk that there is still is an infection? In other words, what is the risk that the donor got infected during the 10 days before death? If we believe the risk is low, then a CDC high-risk donor kidney could be offered to patients. For example, going back to the deceased donor, let's look at the CDC high-risk list, specifically jail time. If someone was in jail, even if it was six months ago and only for three days, they will be labeled CDC high-risk because of what goes on in prison. But if the test was negative, and we know they weren't in prison during the 10 days before hospitalization, the test is likely accurate. There is virtually no risk of an undiagnosed infection. So you can see situations in which a Ferrari kidney with an owner who has done risky things might be worth considering. The general principle is the following. In evaluating a deceased donor kidney, you have to balance the risk of time on dialysis versus the donor risk. Let's say you're 71 years old and you're looking at five years on dialysis. You might be worried that that will be too long and you won't make it. We know that survival goes down on dialysis over time, but the curve is a lot worse for older patients. So such a patient might consider dialysis risk to be much greater than donor risk. This patient might accept a kidney from a CDC high-risk donor with negative blood tests, 
because there's a much smaller risk of dying from disease transmission in that case than dying from dialysis, way smaller. On the other hand, for a young recipient who gets waitlist priority due to age, the donor risk will be more of a consideration because the young patient is not likely to die on the list and will be offered top-notch kidneys anyway. So let's go back to the patient with kidney disease and the choices they face. Really, every step of the way is a balancing of choices. First choice is between dialysis and transplantation. If the patient is healthy enough to undergo major surgery, a transplanted kidney is better than dialysis. Next choice for a patient who qualifies for a transplant in choosing between a living donor and a deceased donor, a living donor offers the best chance at a healthy life. And finally, for a deceased donor kidney recipient, one has to consider the risk of time on the list versus donor risk. Your team will help you in your choices. In making these choices, though, it's helpful to be as informed as you can be. I've oversimplified the waitlist rules to give you a general understanding of the principles involved. But if you wanted to delve into this more deeply, you could go to the UNOS website, which is very extensive. UNOS, or United Network for Organ Sharing, is the organization in charge of regulating the waitlist for the entire country. Also, it's difficult to ask people to be living donors, but it helps to put your story out there. Some recipients have found donors through church. Also, Facebook can be helpful. Facebook has tools to help you create a page to search for living donors. To give you an example of putting the story out there, this is a flyer made by a patient. She had a friend willing to be a living donor, but the friend did not match. So the patient made a flyer telling her story and who she is. She and her friend then went off to a county fair and gave out this flyer. A total stranger took the flyer and decided to be a donor. So the patient was transplanted with this donor's kidney. And then the friend, who wasn't a match, decided to be an altruistic donor to someone on the list who got transplanted as well. In transplantation, we see these miraculous stories every day. And the final point is to be as healthy as you can be. Of course. Thank you for watching this video and stay well.